check. Amen. So good to be at church today. Thank you for taking your time and coming out to uh, Parking Lot Church. And uh, we're, we're thankful that you took the time to do that. Uh, we're going to do some announcements a little later. But if you can, if you're on Facebook, go ahead and share this live. Check in that you're at Aspenwall Church. If you can, we're going to ask you again, please remember, do not honk your horn unless we ask you to. If you want to say amen, flash your lights or put your windshield wiper on or baptize your neighbor and put your washer fluid on, whatever you want to do. But uh, we're thankful that you took time to be here today in uh, church and drive in church. Let's open up in prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you so much. We ask that you'd move by your power and by your spirit today. Touch the praise team as they sing, the preacher as she preaches, in Jesus' name. Let's worship with the praise team.
to say it's different. Um, it's probably different for you sitting in your cars listening to praise and worship. It's different for us. Um, it's, sometimes it's hard to see your faces and uh, see if you're listening, you're worshiping, but all I know is what we want to do. We want to honor God and, and worship Him and praise Him for what He's done. We have been living in such uncertainty and things that have been going on and feeling uneasy, but one thing I know for certain is God is in control. He reigns on high and He is in control of my life and your life. And I would just pray this morning that those of you who are here listening and maybe on online listening or even later that you would be encouraged that God holds your world in his hands. He loves you. And I pray that you would feel his loving arms around you when you are doubting and you are afraid. And we all go through that. But I know we don't have to stay there. We don't have to stay afraid that we know God is in control of everything. And I pray that if you are worried and you face some doubt, that he would just, you would feel his presence and you would feel Lord, uh, the Lord there for you and, and guiding you and lifting you up and encouraging you and just worship with us this morning. God, I pray that you would just reach out to your people, that they would feel your loving and caring arms, your mercy. God, those who are facing difficult times may be touched with this virus is going on, Lord, you are a healer. You are still control of all. Lord, we don't have the answers for everything, but you do. God, we look to you for the answers. We look to you for comfort, for peace of mind, for control in our lives. I thank you, God. There is so much to be thankful for. Your love, your kindness, your mercy, and your guidance. I thank you, God. I thank you for your people, and I can't wait to be able to get together inside Lord, and hug and touch. Lord, that we will wait for that. We will wait, and Lord, it's going to be a glorious and a revivalist time. I thank you, God. I love and I praise you. For every mountain you brought me over for every trial you've seen me through
Go ahead and give the Lord a good honk this morning. Do you got it? Amen. Amen. We're so thankful. We're so thankful for you uh, coming out to the house of the Lord. And uh, we're going to receive the offering after uh, this. But if you uh, if you need a uh, offering envelope, you can put your headlights on. The ushers are walking around. They'll make sure you have it that way at the end. You don't have to uh, worry about it. But if you need an offering envelope, just put your uh, headlights on. Brother Kamisi, Brother Jeff, uh, and uh, Brother Knox will come around. Just put your headlights on and they'll come. While we're doing this, while I'm doing announcements, I want to say don't forget our seed offering is due today. If you have your seed offering, if you don't have your envelope, we can make sure the ushers will uh, ushers will uh, get to you with that uh, envelope so you can write it down. Please write your requests down on them, and after they're already filed and put in, Sister Sudi will give them to me, the envelopes, and uh, we will do our prayer uh, every morning that we're going to be doing with that. Already hearing uh, stories of people that sold something and a miracle happened or something took place, and we're just looking forward to that, and we thank God for that. I want you to know that we'll be doing this next week. Um, we want you to come. I'm going to be preaching next Sunday, and we want you to come out. Invite somebody, drive their car out. Uh, we're, uh, we're able to uh, do that, and uh, we're just thankful that we can come together. If you, if you have not seen, we've got new t-shirts, okay? Uh, the one that's right over here says, I am Revival. They're Army Green. They go up to 3X. And then uh, Brother Marvin has one on. Wherever Marvin is running around here, it says, uh, Sister Amber has one on too underneath her layers. <laughs> uh, it says, Racism is a sin. Uh, that's uh, They're $10 a piece, and all that goes to the capital stewardship so that we can pay our building off. So we want you to uh, please get one of those and uh, help us out. Uh, this week, we're going back to our interviews. Tomorrow night, we'll not have any, but Tuesday, night we'll be interviewing wednesday pastor eve will be teaching online thursday we'll be interviewing and friday we'll be interviewing on the bishops broadcast some of the leaders in the church we want you to uh go on there if you can and uh see see the uh see the broadcast you can ask questions and all of those different things if you would help us out don't forget is it this tuesday sister denise this tuesday right we are doing our food bank this tuesday from five to seven our phones have never rang off the hook like they have okay um, i know that the stimulus checks come out to some some it hasn't but we still have a lot of people that are hurting that needs that and so we need you to help us out we're going to do it like we did last month we're just going to not allow nobody in the building but they'll be able to get their groceries and we'll get them out from five to seven but if you want to come help those if we have too much help there's other things we can be doing cleaning in the store in the in the food room and getting all kinds of things together taking the old stuff putting it towards the front the new stuff towards the back rotating all of that but we need your help well i'm hoping that we'll be able to feed 500 people on tuesday that's what we're praying for and i know that we'll be able to do that all you got to do is show up and bring an id and it's for you too it's for you too if you want to come Come and be uh, with us on Tuesday night. We're still doing the work of the Lord here at Aspenwall Church. Amen. I'm so thankful for that. Um, we are uh, we are great. We have a dear friend in Michigan, um, uh, Pastor Rick Massengill. He was in ICU. He had complications even before he went in with some things. Uh, but um, his, the next day after he got um, uh, he got off of the ventilator, he texts me. He FaceTimed Pastor E uh, that night and, uh, and talked to us. And we thank God for that miracle that God will do great and mighty things. And we're praying for him and his family, Pastor Rick Massengill. And uh, we're thankful so much that the Lord is bringing him through. And uh, we are doing that. This morning, this morning we have a special request. We have a pastor friend near Cincinnati that is uh, we're not going to mention names because he's going to be telling his church today from what I understand but uh, he has cancer in his body and uh, he had been fought it before and it has uh, come back and uh, I want you to keep him on your prayer request uh, pastor friend of ours um, that God will heal him and touch him through that and I know that he'll able to do it we're going to pray we're going to go before the Lord in prayer 
We're going to pray for all of our shut-ins. There's some that are sick. Um, it's, it's, it's been wonderful. We've been praying for Brother Mills. Brother Mills has been here for three weeks. He's right here in the car with Pastor E. And uh, Go ahead and honk your horn that Brother Mills is with us. We love Brother Mills. And uh, we're thankful, thankful for him. We've been praying for him. Sister Dawson is sick. She needs a touch from God. Sister Barb is shut in. She needs a touch from the Lord. Uh, Sister Dinah, I uh, talked to her uh, a little while back, and she seems to be doing better, but she's just taking precautions. But we're praying for her, believing that God will do it. And I know that God will do it for you. And I'm praying for our country. I'm praying, I'm praying for our, uh, our uh, things to come out of this, you know. I tell people, I have so many people that have been calling me in fear. Pastor John, I'm so afraid. I don't want to do this. This thing's going to kill everybody. I refuse to live like that. The reports, the reports yesterday was that uh, they had the highest known cases in the state of Ohio as of yesterday on one day. But what they did not tell you in that is 565 of those, which was a thousand, was from a prison that was given, that was taken two weeks ago. There was really only half of that. Now I'm not demeanoring that there's cases, but what I'm trying to say is some things it ain't always how they appear. God knows how to turn this thing around. God knows how to work it out. And I'm believing that God's going to wipe this thing off the face of the earth. And I believe that God will bring miracles out of it. And through this trouble and trials, I believe God's going to uh, launch a revival like we've never seen across this country, in our community, in our church. And I want to be ready for what God's going to do. I know that God can do it because I've seen him do things before. This ain't nothing to God. There's nothing too hard for God. God's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we could ever ask or think. Right there in your car, if you've got room, will not you lift your hands with me and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray right now over this congregation. I pray, God, that you would do signs and wonders and miracles among these people. God, you've given them to us and we pray for them. We cover them right now. We ask that every sickness be gone. We ask that every mental issue be taken care of. We ask for the mental health issues that is exploding on the scene. Suicides are at an all-time high. Domestic violence is at rampage. Oh, God, we bring them under subjection. We pray that you would do miracles, poverty, things that are happening, people that's lost jobs and have to choose if it's going to be their kids to eat or they're going to eat. God, we break that spirit right now in the name of Jesus. We call every demonic activity back to hell where it came from. We believe in for miracles, signs, and wonders. We know that you can do it. These ones that are here right now in this parking lot that need a miracle in their life, I pray that you will bless them, that you will multiply their household financially, Lord, physically heal their body. In the name of Jesus, we call it done. Sugar, diabetes, go. Cancer, go. Arthritis, go. Right now, high blood pressure, go. In the name of Jesus, Lord, mental suicide thoughts, go. Right now, we're claiming that you will do great and mighty things that we've never seen. Do it in our church. Do it in our people. Do it in our community. Do it in our state. Do it in our nation. Right now, we pray protection over our leader, Anthony Hairston, in our in our in our uh, our county right here. God, we pray over our mayor, Frank Jackson. We pray over our governor, brother, uh, Mr. Dewine. God, we pray over our vice president and president. God, guide them, direct them. We pray over the Congress and Senate. God, guide them, help them to know that you're on your throne and that you can do it. We pray right now that you would bring this back to where it needs to go. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen and amen. Go ahead and honk your horn and say amen. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen. Amen. It's time for the preaching of the Word of God. And after Sister Jalen comes up and preaches, I'll come up, do the altar call, and then we'll do the offering. And uh, we, we'll do that. But I, uh, I asked her to preach today. 
I told her it's going to be a little different. It's not as normal, but just preach like you would in there. I had, I had a, uh, I had a preacher ask me the other day. Said uh, he called me after Easter Sunday. He said, Pastor John. He said, if people ain't saying amen and you can hear them in church, he said, how can you preach when nobody's really around like that or in the sanctuary? I said, because I was never preaching for people in the first place. I'm preaching for the Lord. And so when you preach to God, it don't matter if anybody likes it or not or says amen or not because you do it for the Lord. So I asked her to preach today one last time. Honk your horn and make her feel welcome. She comes to you. or you're in your car, just give God a hand clap of praise because he is worthy of all of our praise. It is truly an honor to be able to speak. Um, I know the predicament is not the way we would want it to be, but in, we I'm glad that we are able to have church no matter how, if it's in the parking lot, if it's online, or if it's in the building. But I want to say thank you to my father and my pastor for allowing me to preach this morning. I always want to give honor to him and to Pastor Emeritus. Can we give honor to them? Hawk your horn. Give them some honor. They deserve it. I'm going straight into the word. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to Ruth chapter 1. Ruth chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along. And if you don't, you can just listen. Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Ruth chapter 1 reads, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he, his wife, and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, in the name of his sons, Malon and Chilion, Ephraites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab, and they continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of Moab, the name one Orpha, and the other one Ruth. Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. And Malon and Chilion, died also both of them and the woman was left of her two sons and her husband then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of moab for she had heard in the country of moab how the lord visited his people giving them bread last verse number seven wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her and they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. If you'll bow your heads with me and pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for everything that you have already done in our lives. Now, God, I'm asking that you will make my thoughts sharp and my words clear. God, let these people hear your words and not mine. God, I pray for three things. I pray that us as the body would be edified. You will be glorified. And through it all, the devil will be horrified. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. For a thought I would like to preach today, I've got favor in the famine. I've got favor in the famine. The account begins, the, the account of Ruth begins in the closing days of Judges, a 400 year period of general anarchy and oppression. When the Israelites were not ruled by kings, but, by, but they were ruled by periodic deliverers whom God raised up when a nation sought against him. Among the judges were Gideon, Samson, and Deborah. Each of these judges were raised up by God, but they were not raised up to rule as kings. But to lead Israel back to a specific challenge, and then they would go back to, so they would not go back to obscurity. The days when the judges ruled were very, very dark days in Israel. The period was characterized by a phrase, everyone did what they thought was right in their own eyes. 
the book of Ruth presents an inspiring journey of God's people from tragedy to triumph. The story is the very mirror opposite of Israel's depressing journey from triumph to tragedy that is presented in the book before called Judges. While Judges is about breaking a covenant and leaving Torah, Ruth is about keeping a covenant and living through the Torah. While Judges emphasized a curse, Ruth emphasized a blessing. While Judges documents self-interest, Ruth documents self-sacrifice. While Judges depicts the lack of kingship, Ruth depicts the line of kingship. The understanding of the book of Ruth may come naturally to Christians who read Ruth as a sequel to Judges. But it is also an emphasis that emerges from the opening chapter of the story itself. The very first verse is set in a historical time frame and braces the audience for bad news. Famine, flight, and in spite of deaths, Naomi leaves for be better places. But when the light begins to shine brightly as God providently provides fertility in the land, people begin to show kindness to one another. God rewards his people with present and future blessings. The reference of the book Famine itself suggests a state of chosen people. That is not a good state. Like I said, famine was not a mere physical problem, but it was a mark of divine displeasure. The land which Jehovah had bestowed upon the children of Israel was supposed to be a land that was flowing with milk and honey. But a threat of starvation in such a fertile land implied that the chastisement of God had fallen upon the twelve tribes of Israel. Because they had neglected his worship and transgressed his laws, for this reason God would withhold the rain from heaven. In all reality, they would have learned from the words of Moses in Deuteronomy. But as we look at Ruth, in the first few verses, we are introduced to a family, Naomi and Elimelech. These are Israelites who are living currently in the promised land. When Elimelech finds out about the famine in the promised land, he takes his family to move to Moab. He takes his family out of the promised land of God. Moab was a very ungodly place. It was a place where they did not worship God. They were pagans or they worshipped many gods. But um, they go to Moab because there is a famine. And Elimelech dies when they move there. And around 10 years after he dies, his two sons die, who married Moabites, leaving Naomi and her two daughter-in-laws in a rough place. They did not have anybody to provide for them. Then Naomi and her two daughters stayed there ten years in the laws and left Moab and went back to the place that God had promised them after she renewed her relationship with God. And as I studied this chapter out and I looked it out, I found three different things that can help us during a time of a famine. The first thing that I found was famines are frustrating. Yeah. The frustrations of a famine. A famine is a shortage of food. In biblical times, a drought was the most common cause of a famine. A drought caused a famine many times in the Bible. Drought caused a famine in the time of Abraham, in the time of Isaac, in the time of Joseph, and in the times of Judges, which is where we're at in Ruth. And to the ancient Israelite, the idea of a famine in the land would have confronted them with a theological challenge. Famine would provoke a faithful person to inquire, how could there be a famine in the land when this land is supposed to be flowing with milk and honey? The milk was from well-fed flocks and herds, and the honey was from luxurious vegetation. How could there be a famine in the land? The Israelites at this time had gone through many sufferings. They had gone through all the pain you could think. They had gone through the feeling of waiting around. They had gone through anything that you could think of. Forty long, irritating years. And now they are settled in their land. God had given Israel the land as a place of rest and blessing. Which means that there is something covenantal about a famine. When the people turned from God, God turned.
turned away from them. The reference in the opening sentence of the book to famine in the land itself suggests the state of God's chosen people. In their case, famine was not a physical contingency, but it was a mark of divine displeasure. The physical fact is stated, but the moral fact is not. The exact date of the famine is not shown, but we know that it occurred during the long period of when the judges judged. The period when the judges judged was from the death of Joshua to the introduction of the monarchy. When Israel rejected Jehovah as their king, and Saul was chosen by the voice of the people to reign over them. Before their entrance into the land, Jehovah, by his servant Moses, impressed upon his people that the land they, itself they should render to him. Their constant love and obedience, lest the land, fertile though it was, shouldn't be stricken with famine. If the Israelites were going to a, into a land expecting to eat and be full. However, in this passage, they are not going to eat and be full because they are experiencing a famine. And to have a famine in a land where you were promised prosperity, it is very frustrating. It was frustrating because they were not hearing from God. Two, it was frustrating because they had nothing to eat. And on top of that, the famine is caused by a drought, so there's also nothing to drink. It was frustrating to be in a land that was supposed to supply all of their needs. But this can be put into context for March 2020. At the beginning of the year, everyone was saying that 2020 is my year. 2020 is perfect and clear vision. So with that, we are saying this is my year, 2020. In 2020, I'm going to get out of debt. In 2020, I'm going to get a good job. In 2020, I'm going to get my breakthrough. In 2020, I'm going to have my joy back. In 2020, I'm going to get my peace. In 2020, I'm going to go from the bottom to the top. I mean, everybody in this room said 2020 was going to be my room, my year. And the reality is, in January, 2020 was still your year. In February, 2020 was still your year. But then March came, and the first two weeks of March was still everybody's year. And the year was perfect. But then came the middle of March, and our perfect year ain't perfect anymore. Our 2020 goals were beginning to look unreachable. But the month of March was a, a month of devastation. It was a month of defeat. It was a month of discouragement. It was a month of famine. We can relate to the people in the book of Ruth during this crisis in our life because it is a frustrating time. A time where you were supposed to have a good job and now you don't have a job at all. A time where you were supposed to get out of debt but now debt just keeps popping. A time when you were supposed to receive a breakthrough, but now you feel like you've been in bondage more than ever before. A time where you were supposed to rise to the top, but you feel like you won't drop all the way to the bottom. A time we are living in times of frustration because of the circumstances that are taking place. It is frustrating to have to put our lives on pause. It is frustrating to have to live out of the normality of our lives. It is frustrating to be locked in a house all day, every day. It is frustrating for the rules to be changed every day. It is frustrating to have to homeschool or homeschool your kids. It is frustrating that seniors don't get to enjoy their last few months of high school. It is frustrating to live in a predicament that we are living in. We are living in frustrating times. The first thing that I found was famines are frustrating. The second thing that I found was there was fatalities that come along with famine. The fatalities of a famine. Not only are famines frustrating, but there are fatalities that come along with them. Verse 3 says, In Elimelech, Naomi's husband died, and she was left, her and her two sons. As you know, a famine was in the land. So Elimelech moved his family from Israel to the country of Moab so that they could be fed. Right. He made a decision out of desire for survival and not out of a desire for salvation. Right. Right. Moab was not in the best place. Moab was not a good place for Elimelech and his family. 
Why? Because he was leaving the promised land that God had given him. And the Moabites did not worship our Lord. It is dangerous to leave the promised land because the Israelites would begin to live among the other nations. And they would begin to take on practices of different religions. And this would break the law of God. Before Elimelech loaded up his family and moved to Moab, it is likely that he had already moved away from God. No one just wakes up one morning and decides that their relationship with God that they built up is all gone. It's a process that keeps building up and the believer begins to move farther and farther away from the Lord more than anybody could ever anticipate. And I truly believe that God was trying to grab a Limelech's attention long before he decided to get up and leave for Moab. In spite of his relationship with God, in spite of God's continuous blessings, in spite of the intervention of the Lord for his family, in spite of the protection that God ensured him, Elimelech got up and moved to Moab. Because what the reality of your heart is will eventually become the reality of your life. And after he was there for some time, he died. And then his sons died shortly after. The Bible does not say how Elimelech died. The Bible does not say why Elimelech died. But however, if you read the chapter and you really study it out, you can educatedly assume that he had died because he was doing what was best for his own will and not doing what was best for God's will. He probably thought at the time that he was doing best for everybody all around. I mean, he didn't have nothing to eat. He didn't have nothing to drink. And, and Moab has something to eat. Moab has something to drink. And that's dangerous with a lot of us. Sometimes we're in the promised land and God is there with us and we have nothing to drink and nothing to eat. But then we traded God's promised land for Moab because Moab looks good and Moab looks appetizing. It's dangerous to do that. You see, the famine was sent to open up the eyes of the backsliders to turn back to God. He was trying to give his people a chance to turn back to him. But instead of him turning back to God, he turned away from God and ran to Moab. And time after time, God gave him chance after chance, but yet he still disobeyed God. During the time that we are living in, do not be like Elimelech and run away from what God is trying to show you. During this time, there are many things that are going around in our lives. You may, may feel like all hell is breaking loose, but I beg you, please don't run to Moab when you have the promised land already. Please don't run to Moab when you've already got the promised land. We are living in a time where many fatalities are going to take place. I'm not talking about physical fatalities and a physical death, but I'm talking about a spiritual death and a spiritual fatality. Yes, yes. During this time, it is not a time to turn away from God, but it is a time to turn to God. It is a time when you don't know what tomorrow will bring. It is a time when our stress levels are on the rise. It is a time where people are fearing walking out of their house. It is a time where we are living in uncertainty. It is a time where people are killing themselves and depression is on the rise and domestic violence is on the rise. It is a time of trials and tribulations, but it is not a time to run to Moab when we already have the promised land. People are dying spiritually during this time because they are not being spiritually fed. With people not being able to gather and go to church like they normally would, people are going to start falling off. We have so much spare time that we should be spending it with God. We should be able to dig deeper into his word and draw closer to him. This pandemic will really show who is in love with God and who is in love with going to church. Because there is a difference between loving God and loving church. The fatalities will not be shown right now, but they will be shown after it's all over. What is sad about the death of Elimelech is one, 
he was faithless, and two, he died, and Naomi and her family was left in devastation. They were left in desolation. It is a time, in that time, the poorest of the poor was a widow who had no child to care for her. These women were left with nothing but desolation, discouragement, and defeat. They were left in a desperate position because nobody could provide for them. I came here to tell you that turning from God may look good now, but in the long run, you will end up like Naomi, defeated, desolated, and discouraged. Do not be a fatality, but be a faithful believer who knows in the end that this famine will just be a memory. And all I've got to say is for me, I don't want to be one of those Christians who fell off as a fatality, but I want to be shown as one who remained faithful through it all. Because the ones who remain faithful, God will remain faithful to them. Number one, famines are frustrating. Number two, there's fatalities that come with them. And number three, in the end, there will be favor in the famine. There will be favor in the famine. Throughout all that was going on in Naomi's life, if we look at verses 6 and 7, we get a little glimpse of hope. We realize that Naomi understood that God was still in the blessing business. God had really never stopped blessing him. Someone came to Moab and said, I've got some good news. God is blessing back in Israel. This sparked a desire in Naomi's heart to go home. Maybe she remembered what it was like to be close to the things of God. Maybe she remembered the sacrifices of the worship. Maybe she missed the fellowship that she once enjoyed with the people of God. I don't know what it is, but all I know is that she woke up in Moab and realized I'm not destined to be here. I have to go home to my promised land. Naomi then rose up and left Moab behind. It was truly a gift from God that even in the midst of her grief and even in the midst of her pain, Naomi was able to hear some good news. Naomi heard that Yahweh, my God, had intervened on the behalf of the people. This word in the clause, which bears a range of meanings, it occurs in military context, which means to assemble, to muster for men and but it is also common in theological texts with God as the subject. In such case, it generally means to attend and to visit. This word is paquad. But the visitation may either be favorable or unfavorable. In negative context, it denotes to intervene against. That is to punish, though always is keeping with the covenant of stipulations. In positive context, the word means to intervene on behalf and to come to the aid of. And this is certainly what God was doing to Naomi by sending this messenger that there he is still in the blessing business. Third, the object of divine favor is Ammo, his people, the nation of Israel. The term expresses the normal covenant between deity and his people. The return of the rains was a signal that God had not forgotten and God had not rejected them. Fourth, Yahweh had given his bread again. The read of Hebrew will recognize the play in the name Bethlehem. The bread, the house of bread, is being restocked. God had given people bread. They, they had a favor after the famine. In all reality, the ones who remained faithful during the famine had the favor after the famine. During this time of difficulty, during this time of anxiety, during this time of stress, during this time of unknown circumstances, during this time of famine, during this time of plague, during this time in our lives, please, I beg you, remain faithful to God. Remain faithful in your Bible reading. Remain faithful in your praying. Remain faithful in 
your giving. Remain faithful in your church attendance. Whether you're having church with your family or you're watching online or you're in the parking lot. Remain faithful and God will have favor upon you. You might not be able to see the favor right now, but it is coming to those who are remaining faithful during famine times. The ones who are not remaining faithful during this time, when the favor comes, they're going to wish that they remain faithful. To all the ones that criticize their pastors, to all the ones that bashed everybody, to all the ones that talked about somebody, to all the ones that lied about somebody, to all the ones who were spreading faith to all the ones that was withholding their giving purposely, to all the ones who lied on others, they're going to wish that they listened to God. They're going to wish that they didn't listen to what the media had to say. They're going to wish that they remained faithful. They're going to wish that they listened to God and not themselves. Because the ones that were faithful, God is going to shower you with favor. After all of this is said and done, just like the house of bread or Bethlehem or like we know it, the promised land was restocked, the favor rested upon them. So we, our spiritual house, will be restocked. What do I mean? The revival is coming to those who want it, to those who receive it, to those who were faithful during the times of the famine. The favor will be upon us. Right. Not just any favor. The Lord's favor will be upon us. We will go from sick to healed. We will go from broke to rich. We will go from fire to higher. We will go from broken to whole. We will go from defeated to we've got the victory. We will go from fearful to I can do all things who through Christ who gives me strength. We will go from failure to success. We will go from excluded to being included. We will go from being a loser to being a winner. We will go from doors being shut due to this predicament to doors being open like never before to the ones who remain faithful. We won't be bound anymore, but we will be free. We're going to rise from the bottom to the top. And I've heard a lot of people during this time say, I don't think we're going to survive. Well, you haven't read your Bible if you don't think we're going to survive. Because the Bible says we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. For eyes have not seen and ears have not heard, neither entered into the heart of man. The kind of blessings that God has prepared for those who love him or those who are faithful to him. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. For weeping may endure for the night, but joy is coming in the morning. Joy, everlasting joy. Joy, enduring joy. Joy is coming in the morning. The Bible says, fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold my righteous hand. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed, for the Lord is with you wherever you go. For you, the Lord your God fights for you to your enemies and he will give you the victory. The Bible says in Psalms, may the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. May the Lord make a way out of no way. Do not be discouraged because favor is coming to those who are faithful. Amen. Go ahead and honk your horn one more time. Amen. I'm looking for that favor, aren't you? I'm looking for that favor that God is going to do. It is frustrating and we know there is fatalities, but thank God that we've got favor with the Lord. Sister Amber begins to play and uh, please, uh, at this time, we're going to ask that you bow your head. Maybe there's somebody here that don't know the Lord. Maybe you're listening on the street. Maybe you're listening down the road. Uh, maybe you're uh, you're tuning in by Facebook. 
whatever whatever it may be uh, we know that you can hear me right now we don't have to have you right at the altar you can pray exactly where you're at today if you don't know the Lord as your personal Savior I'm going to ask you to pray with me but praying with me will not make you saved because you have to believe what you're praying you got to confess with your mouth and you got to accept the Lord as your personal Savior. Right in your cars where you're at, right on Facebook where you're at. If you're listening on the street, maybe you're listening on YouTube, whatever it is, whatever source, phone, maybe you're driving down the road and listening. I just want to pray with you. Can you pray with me? Say, Lord Jesus, I'm so sorry for my sins. God, I give my life to you, everything that I am. Lord, I believe you died on the cross for me. Lord, I believe you rose from the dead for me. God, I believe you're coming back one day out of heaven for me. So God, come into my heart and be my Savior. I give my life to you this very moment. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer inbox us let us know last week i think we had four that inbox us that told us that they prayed with me and gave their heart to the lord just tell us about it so we can give you some information that you need to know also there's maybe here right now and you want me to pray over you you want me to pray over fear maybe something in your body that you need god to heal maybe you're watching at home right now we've got many families in our church that are watching from home if you're right there, I just want you to stretch your hand towards the camera. Stretch your hand towards the phone. If you're here in this audience, stretch your hand towards me. I want to pray for you. I want to pray over you. Father, I pray blessings and honor right now over this congregation. We pray right now that you will heal whatever the situation is. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's depression. Maybe it's financial struggle. Maybe it's disease. Maybe it's sickness. Maybe it's family problems. Lord, it could be a host of things, but right now I pray that we break every chain of bondage right now. Right now that is in this congregation. Maybe you're watching online. Maybe you're watching on YouTube. Maybe you're listening right now. Oh, God, I pray that you would break those chains of depression or sickness or whatever the ailment is. God, do it right now in Jesus' name. Do it right now. I pray multiplicity of blessings right now over financial struggles. I pray that you'll do greater things. Lord, not only will I pray that you will allow some to be blessed, maybe by stimulus programs, maybe by unseen things, but God, I pray that you would send checks in the mail. God, I pray that you would send blessings to our people. But not only that, God, I pray that you would heal their body. God, my friend right now in Cincinnati that is dealing with cancer, I pray that you'll heal his body. Touch that congregation, God, as they're getting ready to go through a second round of this. We send that nasty cancer back to hell. Brother Tanner in Cincinnati that needs a touch that's on the mend of healing with COVID-19. Pastor Rick Massengill right now in his home. God, that he's dealing with this, strengthen him. Bring him back, oh God. Thank you for bringing Pastor Wayne Eisen through it. Oh God, do it right now. Touch, Lord, minister, deliver, heal, set free. By your spirit we pray. Why don't we sing with Sister Amber? Come on, can we sing just a chorus and then we're going to do the offering. We're going to sing. Just worship the Lord right where you're at. Just worship the Lord right where you're at today. Hallelujah.
Amen. Did you enjoy that preaching and that singing today? Go ahead and honk your horn. Amen. Thank God. Thank God. So next week we're going to be having parking lot service, and then next week I want to, I want everybody to hear me clear. If you are a leader in our church, a um, one that meets with us after service next week, we're going to tear down, and then real quick we're going to have a meeting downstairs, and we're going to all get together and make a comeback plan. Okay, I've got some things, but I want to get your input, and I'm going to need your help. So if you are a leader in the church next week, I need you to stay around for about 30, 40 minutes if you can. We're going to meet. I've got some things I want to pass out, and we're going to uh, show you how, and we're going to brainstorm and come together how we can uh, come back into the service and have church. But I will say, um, the first Sunday in June, we are going to be having uh, Pastor Nick Hill. He's going to be bringing his bluegrass group, and we're going to have Old Fashioned Sunday. And what we're going to do is um, we're going to come outside as long as it's not raining. We're going to have outdoor service, and we're going to have a big uh, old-fashioned potluck dinner on the grounds on Sunday. And we're going to park our cars around the edges of this parking lot and around over here. And we're going to ask everybody to bring their own lawn chairs, and we're going to put tables out. And we're going to have service outside. The bluegrass group, he's got a whole group, three or four people that's coming. He's going to sing and preach, and then we're just going to have dinner on the grounds on that Sunday, the first Sunday in June. And so we're going to ask Sister Nora's going to get some food together. We're going to get with her, Brother Tone. We're going to order some. Uh, we're going to order some backdrops. We're going to do some free pictures, and we're asking everybody to wear old-fashioned clothes. It's going to be old-fashioned Sunday. I'm going. I got to go buy me some bib overalls. I'm going to buy me. Uh, bring your cowboy hat. Bring it. Whatever. Whatever you want. We're going to do that. Pastor Nick Hill's going to be here, and we're going to have dinner outside. We're going to have a big singing out here. But you're going to have to bring your own lawn chairs, okay? And if you don't have them, we'll help you. But we're going to set tables up here. We're going to have the whole parking lot empty. And we're just going to sit out and have a time of service. And then after the service, we're going to have dinner on the grounds outside. And if it is if it is raining, we're going to move it over to the new, the new church, uh, the new uh, uh, outreach building. Listen to me prophesy. I don't even know it. I hope we grow so big we got to move over there. But we're going to have it over there if it rains okay so we're still going to have dinner on the grounds and we're going to have pastor nick's going to bring bluegrass brother tone's going to do some pictures we're going to order an old-fashioned background you and your family come and we're going to ask everybody to bring some food sister Nora will get it together and our praise team will open and then we're just going to turn it over to pastor nick they're going to sing eight or nine bluegrass music songs uh southern gospel songs and then he's going to preach and we're just going to have dinner on the grounds the first sunday in june they're going to come and be here and so we're looking forward to that okay that's what we're going to do uh we we, we rescheduled our revival to the first week in may but since all of this is going on and I don't want to have huge crowds inside right now. We're just going to cancel the spring revival altogether, and we'll just do it in the fall. So this that Sunday will kind of be our spring revival with Pastor Nick Hill and the Bluegrass Group is what we're going to do. And uh, then we'll have those preachers back. So we're going to ask the ushers to come, and uh, we're going to pray over the offering real quick. If you did not turn in your resurrection, give me one of those resurrection seed offering. I'm going to turn mine in. Uh, do that. They they got a place where you can put on your prayer request. Okay, those that done the twenty one day fast, fill one of these out. Sow a seed, whatever it is. I've had many people. What should I do? Whatever the Lord tells you to do. I ain't told anybody what to do with it. It's not a a, a thing to get money. It's a seed that you sow. How many knows that you can't have a harvest unless you sow seed? Amen. Sow seed. And uh, you can never, you can always cut an apple open and count the seeds that are in an apple. But you can never cut that seed open and see how many apples are in that seed. You got to sow it. You got to put it down in the ground. 
So we ask that you fill one of those out. If you, if you uh, ushers, um, if they need to get you one, they will. Uh, we have both of them. Write your, uh, your request down. Sister Sudi will make sure after we record the offerings and all that properly like we do. Uh, she'll give me the envelope and then I'm going to have a prayer thing that we're doing over it. Uh, don't worry about people seeing it. I'm the only one. Me and Sister Sudi will be the only ones to see it. But I'm going to have that as my prayer request. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the gift and giver. And we thank you for a wonderful church. Thank you for unexpected blessings that some have gotten. I know they've given testimony. Said, Pastor, I got my stimulus this week. I'm going to pay my tithes. Or, Pastor, somebody gave me this and I didn't expect it. Pastor, somebody dropped off uh, 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 groceries at my house and I didn't even ask them to. Thank you for all of those unexpected blessings. We ask that you would bless our church, bless our people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. After they get your offering here in a few minutes, be careful as you leave. You can come up and get your new t-shirts, the Army Green and the Racism is a Sin. Or you can pay your tithes online right here or AspenWallChurch.com or text to give 925-GIVE. 216-925-GIVE is what it is. God bless you. If you want to get out, just make sure you uh, social distance uh, yourself six feet apart. But you come and pay your tithes online right up here or buy the shirt for $10 a piece. God bless you is my prayer. One more time, honk your horn and tell Sister Jane to be